The year was 1925, and it was the 30th of May when a group of determined men and women saw their vision become a reality. On that date, John Wellborn Martin, then governor of the state of Florida, signed legislation creating from parts of St. Lucie and Palm Beach counties a new county, Martin County. This is the story of these men and women as told by those who know their history best. Listen as the children and grandchildren of our pioneers share their past in their own words. Uh, the Frasers came in 1887, left Chicago and came to Jacksonville. And after two years, they moved to Sanford. And then they came from Sanford down to Stewart. And when he wanted to, to come down, down the way, he put everything on, got everything moved over to Titusville. He had a horse and, buggy, horse and wagon, all of his uh, home furnishings, and the material from the ice house with a cat and a dog and chickens, everything that the family had, put on a barge and was pulled down the river, came in, came down the uh, Indian River Lagoon, turned into the St. Lucie River mouth, came through, and then it came to this creek and decided that was a nice place. So they pulled up into the creek, put everything out on the shore, and that's where they landed. It is now called Fraser Creek. And they immediately put up as much as they could of a house with the uh, lumber that they had brought from the ice house. It was just three-sided, and they hung something in the front door for the fourth side. My uh, family arrived in this area in the early 1900s. Uh, my, gr my grandfather was a fisherman up in Titusville, Florida, and they, he moved his family down here to Stewart on a barge, a big floating platform, so to speak, from Titusville here to Stewart. First, they had a, a house, I never will forget, this house was a two-story building, a kind of east of where the present Martin County Hospital North is located, and they lived in that house, right beside the river, because they were fishermen. So naturally, they wanted to be close to the water. My family came in uh, 1913. Went to Miami first, and my father asked for, uh, to, to, for him to tell him a quiet little fishing village where he could go and hunt and fish and regain his health. They said, well, uh, we know about a little town named Stewart, and um, wh which we think will fill the bill for you. And so that's how we happened to come to Stewart. There was my mother and father, and my my brother, who was about uh, nine years old, and I was two years old. So, see, they were in Arkansas, and he was a Methodist minister, circuit rider. And Uncle John Taylor was his stepson. The doctor said he had to come down here to get to a better climate. So he resigned from the ministry and got on a train and came down here and found a place and built a house and raised a family here. And he was in the real estate business too and, and insurance and did it out of his own home right there next to the Methodist Church. I, I like that heritage and I like those roots. My grandfather McCrary, uh, P.R. McCrary, hired and he went all over Florida to find a place to retire. And he liked Martin County because it had all the waterways in it. It had, you know, the North Fork, South Fork, Bessie Creek, and he liked that. So that's why he chose to come here. And my dad was a dentist, uh, but at the time they didn't have electricity here every day. They had electricity in town on Wednesday afternoon so the gals could do their ironing. But other than that, they didn't have it. So dad went up to Jacksonville and practiced with the dentist up there until they had electricity every day. And John Taylor, the uh, insurance man, sent Dad a telegram, said, we have electricity every day, come on down. And so he did. It came down in uh, 1924. And they took a train from Jacksonville to Stewart. It took eight hours. And uh, 
they got here at 2 o'clock in the morning and mom heard dad say when he got off the train because there was nobody here. And he said, my God, what have I done? My father was a charter boatman up in the Delaware, on the Delaware Bay in New Jersey. And uh, he had a fishing party in 1917. They said, well, they had been down to a place in Florida called Stewart. And uh, they were guests at the Bay Tree Lodge, which used to be over on the, the uh, source point. Fishing was just fabulous. That they'd, They would uh, catch, oh, any number of trout and snook and different kinds of fish. He decided to come down to Florida. And he'd saved like $500. And he, uh, mother didn't want to come. She was, she was, <laughs> She'd heard about the snakes and the alligators, and <laughs> so she didn't want to come, but we, he came anyway. And we three children, we came down on a steamship, merchant miner steamship out of Philadelphia. We came into Savannah first, and then out of Savannah into Jacksonville, and then we got the train down to Stewart. And Dad uh, found a place to stay on Akron Avenue, I believe it was. It was sort of out in the sticks in those days. And uh, it's just almost across from the courthouse <laughs> to, to the north. Then he went down to the wharf and talked to some of the fishermen, commercial fishermen. And they told him that uh, he wanted to know if there's any place he could buy a boat or if there's any boats for sale. And they said the only one they knew of was up in Jensen. But in any event, he went up to Jensen. And they talked to this fellow that he was, he had had this fishing boat called the Phantom. It's 24 foot with a one cylinder engine in it. And uh, he asked him how much he wanted for it. He uh, said he wanted $500 for the boat. And uh, Dad said, well, I don't have $500. Well, he said, I'll take $100 down if you have it and uh, $100 a month. So Dad bought the little boat. So he started fishing. And uh, he f did real well. As a matter of fact, he, uh, the fish was so plentiful. He had come in usually with 800 to 1,000 pounds of bluefish or Spanish mackerel every day, just like the rest of them. They came down to uh, uh, Fort Meade in Arcadia. They worked in the orange groves there. And then they heard about how you could grow two crops a year in, uh, on the lake down near Okeechobee. So they went down uh, between, it's at a little old place called uh, uh, Chansey Bay, uh, between Indian Town and Pahokee. And I had an uncle that was a range rider and uh, Warfield had already come to Indian Town in uh, about 1923 he began to come there and the railroad came through during that time and he was wanting to make that a term table so he'd begun the construction there and Uncle Frank rode through there to uh, dip the cattle and he seen all this construction so he went down and told grandma and them said move on up to Indian Town said it's going to really be a boom town <laughs> he was in the Navy as a Navy pilot and he was flying out of uh, Miami I guess he had dinner tea, and he and mother met there. Then he went back to Boston, I understand, and graduated from college, then came back here and married mother and stayed here. He was a Yankee that came to Florida and stayed. Walter Kitchen was from Leeds, England. He came to this country in 1867 after Lincoln was assassinated. His father was a stockbroker in London, and they had an office in New York City and he was sent to New York City to help manage that office and didn't stay there too long. He was adventuresome and took a wagon train out west and taught school to the Indians in Oklahoma for a stint, went to Texas for a while and came to Florida and bought property from a government map in Gainesville, Florida in this area, he bought several parcels in Martin County, and in 1883, he came down to see what he had purchased. Josephine Kitching, born in 1895, March 10, 1895. She was born in Potsdam, born in the house, the old house on the river there, 210 Atlanta Avenue. It's now rented by the South Florida Water Management District. But she was born in that house in the upstairs bedroom, as were two of her three children. She was an only child. Stanley Kitchen was uh, one of his children. Stanley, very enterprising. I uh, believe they called him Commodore Kitchen. 
He had a uh, hotel. He was also president of the Stuart Chamber of Commerce at one time. My mother's name was Emma Taylor, born in October 1917. Her sister, Celia, was born in 1915, and then a brother came along in 1921, John E. Taylor, Jr. And uh, he is still living. He's a doctor in uh, Atlanta. My grandfather and grandmother Roebuck brought their family here in 1907 uh, from Bassinger, Florida, over on the Kissimmee River. There were seven children and settled in tropical farms. At the time, of course, it was just wagon tracks on the Indian Town Road. Uh, the way the road wound around, the wagon tracks wound around, go around ponds and things, you know, back then. Uh, it was probably about a 12 mile drive from Stewart out to where they lived. The, the first one was my uh, great uncle, was a Dyer from, Will Dyer from. Uh, St. John's, Newfoundland. He came down in uh, 86 and said how wonderful it was and told my grandfather to come on down. And he came down the next year and he stayed here. Now, uh, the other side of the family was settled in Jensen with my grandfather E.J. Riku and my great uncle R.R. Uh, R. Riku. Papa settled on, homesteaded on the quarter section on the uh, North Fork on the main side of the river, the west side. He had a piece that touched the water on the South Fork and the north end of it touched the water on the North Fork. He was from the old school rough. They say he would stand toenail to toenail with you and call you anything under the sun and dare you to do something about it. They say he came here because he was a gun for hire out in uh, Alabama. And uh, so he killed the wrong guy. And so he left the country to come down here where we're still wild. And R.R. R. died at an early age where my grandfather lived on for quite a few years. But they came to Jensen and they ran fish houses up and down the coast, had quite a few of them. My dad's name was Earl J, or Earl Julius Riku. And uh, at an early age, my grandfather bought him a boat because he went to what they called the scrappers, which were the commercial fishermen. But he would get up before school and make a loop around the river and visited all the scrappers and had box to put their fish in, in the boat, and then an envelope with their money for last night's work. My parents had started wintering in Florida. They first went over to St. Petersburg in that area, but they didn't care for it. And then they went to Miami and they were interested in sports fishing. And of course, um, Stewart had the reputation of of good sports fishing, the sailfish capital of the world. And that's when they moved up to Stewart. I think in the early 20s, they bought land during the real estate boom. You know, when we had the real estate boom in Florida. James R. Pomeroy, that's James Rob Pomeroy, he came down here in the, at the turn of the 18th century with his brother Will from Croswell, Michigan. So he moved to Orlando and he had nothing to do with our development here. But my grandfather, James, stayed because he wanted to be, he had been trained to be a teacher. And at that turn of the century, he was a teacher and principal up in Fort Pierce. He met my grandmother at the school. She was a teacher also in Fort Pierce. And um, then later on, they got married and moved down to Stewart. And that's when he started uh, buying land and planting pineapples, um, made his home here, even though he was still involved with the school system and we were part of Dade County at that time. And then he got involved in the in Board of Public Instruction and became the uh, superintendent once we became Palm Beach County. Grandfather was involved with 
the incorporation of the town of Stewart, the um, uh, Woodmen of the World, the Masons, getting, getting all these civic organizations going to make Stewart and Martin County a place that people would know about. He was appointed postmaster of the Stewart Post Office in 1918, and that's where he stayed as, until he was appointed clerk of the circuit court when Martin County was created in 1925. And people moved to South Florida for opportunity, which is why they came. He was a young man in St. Augustine, and he just worked for uh, some boat builders. And the wealthy people who had estates in this area were always looking for people who were knowledgeable about the water. And my granddad was just, he was wonderful. I mean, he knew boats backwards and forwards. So he had just married my grandmother who was also from North Florida. She was from St. Augustine also. And they came to Stewart for work. Uh, an industrialist was in St. Augustine looking for someone to run his boat, and he was directed toward my grandfather. That was either 1911 or 1912. And my mother and her sister, Mary, were born in a house which is on, still exists on Palm City Road. We had one commissioner from this area, uh, Mr. Gaines, and he would try to get things for uh, our north part of the county, but uh, he wasn't always successful because most of the population was in West Palm Beach. Well, we were kind of stepchildren when we were in Palm Beach County. We were neglected and we wanted to become a, a county uh, independently. West Palm Beach was treating everybody else like a stepchild in those days. They were keeping all the good things and doling out very little. They were building the St. Lucie Canal and they, they were having such a difficult time trying to get uh, materials in there too, uh, to them that the, no roads or nothing and they, so they decided that, uh, that it would be better if they become a county of their own that they would be, they would be able to prosper more. Yeah. My grandfather was part of a committee called the Committee on County Division that was formed by Stanley Kitchen. And this was a final effort to make Martin into a county. And this group of dedicated men, originally there were seven on this committee and gradually others were added to it. So this big effort was made. My father was very involved being a real estate man and he he put up, I remember he put up some money. Uh, all the business people were asked to put up $1,000 to help get this through the legislature. But their task was to get the county started. And it was really kind of a difficult progress because they did not have a lot of outside support. A great deal of politics played into this and a, a great deal of kind of falling through on promises. For example, they went to the representative from Palm Beach County at that time whose name was McCracken. And McCracken gave them a very almost impossible task. He said, if you get a certain amount of signatures on a petition, I will sponsor the bill to create Martin County. One account that I read said he required 2,500 signatures. Another account in a later paper edition said 3,600 signatures. He might as well have required a couple of million because in that time there were only about 1,000 people living here. And McCracken really did not want our county to be formed because it was a very lucrative area and a lot of tax money went into West Palm Beach. So, he gave them this task realizing that they probably wouldn't get it done. He never dreamed that they would be able to get all the names. They enlisted the Women's Club to help go from door to door and they got in excess of the number of signatures and it's, it was something like 4,000. After they have got these signatures they presented them to McCracken who quickly backed down and uh, reneged on his promise. So then they started going to Tallahassee. They went to Tallahassee and these men that were on the committee, they were schemers, they were dreamers. 
the leader was Harry Lyons. And of course, Ed Miniger, Sr., and uh, then the people that were on the committee, like uh, Jackson McDonnell and uh, Warner Tilton and uh, John Taylor, uh, they succeeded. And the leaders of our town, Walter and Stanley Kitchy and Kruger and a bunch of others, got on the train in West Palm Beach to lobby the governor for creation of a county. And they told him about why they needed the county and how it would benefit Florida and why it would be much better and everything like that. And the legend is that he finally said to him, well, what will you call this county? Why, Martin County. And it sailed through right along with Indian River County without a hitch. And I got this idea of having it named for Governor Martin. Well, that kind of had a great influence with the governor really helped to push that through. What really clinched the deal was Governor Martin. He liked having the place named after himself. So he said this is going, in essence, he said this is going to happen. Also have in my possession a copy of a telegram dated May 28th, 1925. It simply states, we win. Martin County passed the Senate at 5.30. Governor Martin signed it May 30th, 1925. We began to function as a county August 5th, 1925. Governor Martin and Mrs. Martin were childless and uh, this was an opportunity to really uh, to perpetuate their name and they really acted like Martin County was their child. They were determined that it would be launched successfully. Florida real estate boom was just a crazy phenomenon. There's never been anything in the history of the world quite like the Florida real estate boom. Uh, people were pouring into Florida and there was frenzied activity of development. There were so many plats filed and so many subdivisions planned and uh, this was going on in what became Martin County. So then when the Florida land boom came, by that time the entrepreneurs of that era that held onto these large tracts of land decided, well, they weren't going to plant pineapples anymore. They were going to subdivide their land and make places for people to come and live and build homes. So that's what they did out in the St. Lucia Estates area, the, out towards um, Indian Town on State Road 76. Uh, all, all the areas that were had huge plantations, they just stopped their pineapples and started cutting up in little lots and, and building homes. The Florida boom came along, and naturally, being a real estate man, that was too much for my father. He had to get into the real estate business in Stewart, and so we, he, um, we sold our property, our home in, in Evanston, and um, moved down to Stewart, made our home here. Stewart really began to grow at that time. The people were coming into Florida to buy property because there was such a real estate boom going on. People were building homes and uh, there was a lot going on in Florida at that time. For a while, everything was uh, very beautiful. The um, people thought that they'd hit pay dirt and uh, Florida was going to be a pie in the sky, you know. The railroad had just come through Indian Town in 1923, and he had envisioned making this a t the turntable, which is uh, was later on made at Wildwood. But he thought it was going to be an Indian Town, and those old tracks are still there. They laid the tracks, and he built uh, the Seminole Inn. He built the depot. He built an old uh, first. He built an old long wooden building. We called it the big building there in Indian Town, and in that they had the seaboard offices and in the construction and uh, underneath was uh, a store, a grocery store later on, but during in 23 there was no grocery store there. And he, they moved there and he had envisioned a great big uh, deal there for the Seaboard Railroad in Indian Town. The people who were working together to form Martin County had huge dreams of what Stewart would become a port, a commercial port. The canal that would connect the Atlantic with the Gulf of Mexico. And the big promotional thing that they would do would say, 
this is um, the Atlantic Gateway to the Gulf of Mexico, and they even formed a great big archway over the highway. They looked at Miami, and they looked at Jacksonville, and they thought what we have is far superior, what we have that nature has given us, and we are going to be larger and more prosperous and more populated than these places. And that's what they hoped for. The Depression hit Florida long before 1929, or at least it was right at the end of 1926. We knew hard times had begun. The hurricane came in 1926 in Miami, and things just started to turn around. Suddenly, uh, these land deals were not succeeding. The property wasn't turning over anymore. And suddenly, people started to go back north, and uh, everything just fizzled. It was kind of slow. I mean, we didn't, uh, didn't have a whole heck of a lot to eat. I remember uh, a Sunday dish was uh, a real treat, was apricot. They heated up somewhere, it had apricot and graham crackers. That was our Sunday special deal. And it seems like Florence Rico found that the recipe somewhere. It was really pretty good. You know, it gave you a lot of, got a lot of zip. And I remember once going to the 10 cent store and I wanted to get a car. And mom said, no, you can't have that. And I said, why? Because they said, this is the depression. And of course I said, what's the depression? And she explained it to me as best, best she could. My mother was uh, very creative about cooking. Uh, somebody paid my daddy with a cow. Somebody gave him sweet potatoes, fish. I think they probably, some people paid Dr. Parker the, the same way. And you just survived, you know? They told us if we didn't have fish and grits, we'd have starved to death. <laughs> but I can remember going rabbit hunting across on the island there and getting sometimes as many as 10 rabbits and bringing them back. And we'd always eat rabbit, fish, grits, everything else. But that fish was always free. The bubble burst in 1929. And you were a millionaire one day, you were a pauper the next day. Hardly anyone had money. Everybody was working at anything they could find. Even well-educated people took jobs in the grocery stores or whatever they could get, you know. The money was very scarce. You never went to the movies or spent a nickel that you couldn't, didn't have to. You just, um, uh, everything went to buy groceries or pay the light bill or. Um, there was surplus government foods. There was canned beef, there were sides of bacon, there were bags of grits, bags of cornmeal and things of that sort. And they'd come in, a shipment of it would come in, and practically everybody was on, I guess you would call it welfare, it was the relief roll. And I had an old car and I used to take that around to people, Port Mayaka, Indian Town, you know, all around Hope Sound, and delivered where people would come and get it. And uh, these surplus government commodities. I remember the canned beef was pretty good. It was a beef stew. When the land boom quit, which that's what brought them here, and the depression started, those people just kind of disappeared. And it, it seemed like we were back to our original people that had been here all along. During the bust up there, he'd be up on the second floor and they had a, a, a roof that went over the garage or the carport and he'd take the bread and feed the cardinals and the blue jays out there. And my grandmother said, Pierce, quit feeding the birds the bread, that's our supper. We mustn't look back and think these were the good old days. There was rum running, there was a lot of, there were murders. There was a lot of corruption in public officials. There were uh, pool room brawls and murders. There were quite a few people being sent to rape during that era. And so it really was a wild and woolly time. In the late 1800s, they had open, uh, open range. And they, this, uh, we, they just would build a cow pen and then everybody would drive their cattle in there and they'd, uh, they'd mark and brand and do what they had to do. But um, nobody had just a set of cow pens of their own. They was just big old cow pens. So uh, Mr. Mary and Platt and a bunch of men met there to work that day and uh, they got to drinking. 
and they got to arguing. Him and another fellow got to arguing. And so uh, they finally got a hold of him and they said, oh, you know, let's, it's not worth fighting over, let's just go. So they took, they left. And the next day they went to another cow pen and uh, was working there. And when they did, this guy showed up again. And when he did, uh, 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 Marion Platt shot him and killed him. And he run home, because it was a while before they could get the law out there. So he run home and, uh, and got his things and he moved to a hammock outside of uh, Arcadia. And uh, when they came, when the sheriff finally come to his house, they asked uh, Miss Annie Platt, they said, uh, uh, where, where's your husband? And, and she said, well, he said he was going to California. And uh, so he lived out there in that hammock for about a year in the Parker's Brothers uh, fed him, you know, and took him his supplies. And, and today it's still known as California Hammock. But anyway, he decided that he would go down to Cuba. So he went over to Fort Myers and caught a, a cattle boat and went to Cuba. And he stayed for a while. And uh, he said, well, I'm just going to go home and face the music. He missed his wife and missed his children. So he went back uh, to Arcadia. And that was the first, they, the very first trial they had in the Arcadia courthouse. And of course, they pronounced him innocent. The, <laughs> this one had gone, that one gone. So they pronounced him innocent. When he did, he gathered up everything he had, took a few orange trees from a grove there and gathered up everything he had. And he struck out and he settled in Indian town. Yeah. That was during the rum running days as well, you know, and uh, that was sort of exciting. Because they were prohibited from making any rum in the United States, but they were importing it uh, illegally from the Bahama Islands. So they had these boats that would go over there and, and come in at night and with their uh, loads of rum, which were, they'd put in sacks, uh, uh, burlap sacks, and then they had, the bottles would be protected by uh, reed s sleeves like. And the reason for that was that they could throw them overboard and they'd sink rather than being in boxes. The boxes would probably float. The local police, they didn't bother them anyway because they were all paid off. They, they, they would get a uh, sack of whiskey every once in a while or <laughs> a case of liquor, you know. And one of the times when they were uh, running, uh, a boat started chasing, actually it was one of, our, one of, the, one of the boats from Stewart. Uh, he'd been drinking a little bit too much and he went out in the river with a party and he started chasing one of these boats and the boats thought, uh, one of these rum runners, and the rum runners thought it was the law and they started unloading their liquor and and next day why all the Salerno fishermen were out there with grapple hooks and they were grappling and every once in a while one of them would grapple into a sack of liquor you know and haul it up and they'd let a war hoop and everybody would gather around them they'd open up a bottle of liquor and by the end of the day why <laughs> it was really a wild party out there. <laughs> Uh, in the late 1880s, Henry Flagler was moving his railroad line south. The original plan was for him to drive his railroad straight south down the center of Sewell's Point, jump over Hell's Gate, go down through Rocky Point, and on down to West Palm Beach. But this was pineapple growing country in those days, and the people of Sewell's Point were especially vehement in their opposition, and they flat refused to deal with him at all. Walter Kitching sent him a letter that said, uh, I'll give you the right of way for your railroad and $400 if you'll bring your railroad to Stewart. Well, Flagler said that was acceptable, but he wouldn't take his money, but he would bring his railroad because he could get the right of way. But Kitching had failed to tell him that he only owned land for about 300 yards back from the river. And the land past that point was owned by Otto Stippman and his brother. They laid out their fields in a grid system running north and south and east and west. And eventually when the town grew up, they would have their, they would convert their field paths into roads and they would sell off city lots from their pineapple fields. And Flagler's Railroad would cut diagonally across their grid system and mess it up, something awful. So they had a fence on their property line and they put Kurt Schroeder, who was their, their nephew, sitting up on the fence with a large shotgun. 
and told him to keep Flagler's crews from coming on to the property. You need to know that later on Kurt Schroeder was a mayor and a commissioner and finally a much beloved city commissioner of the city of Stewart. He sat there with a shotgun and wouldn't let the railroad crews on. And he sent a message back to Flagler and it supposedly said it's a damn Dutchman here with a shotgun and he will shoot if we come on his property. Well, he found an attorney in St. Augustine who was Dutch and more importantly, who could hold his liquor. And he sent him south to negotiate with the Stipmans with $400 to pay for the right of way and a two gallon jug of corn whiskey. The attorney suggested that before they got started, since things were sort of dry, maybe they ought to pass around the jug to just wet your whistle as it was and get things started. So they would negotiate and then he would pass the jug and I don't know whether he drank or not, but at the end of the day, the jug was empty. He had the right of way and $200 and the railroad could now cut on a diagonal across the Stipman's property. Well, the, the impact of that is seen today in Confusion Corner. When you see that place, uh, lay a two gallon jug of corn whiskey. She told me there were only seven cars in the county and the road at that time was just a, what is A1A now? And it was not paved, she told me. One lane. And I said, well, how did you meet a car? That's why when she told me there was only seven cars. She said, well, you could see them coming down the road because of the dust. And the first person that got to a place they could turn out would turn out and wait for the other person to go past. The person that they had met would stop and wait to see that they got back on the road. I thought that was nice. I remember going out one morning and I was just walking around out there in front of our house. And all of a sudden I came up on a big old cat about that high and he was orange looking. And I looked at that cat and I says, darn, that's a funny looking cat. And he looked at me. And after a while I said, my God, that's a funny, funny, that's a funny looking cat. And I turned and went back. And that old cat ran off toward the old creek, going out toward the cemetery. So, and I didn't find that until later on that that was really a panther that I had run up on. But he didn't attack me and I didn't attack him. So. Every um, Saturday night we would drive in, go in, in the store. And uh, that was the time when the Indians would always come in to shop. And that was a very interesting thing because uh, they would buy one type of cloth and pay for it buy another piece and pay for it until they had a big package, but they couldn't add and subtract, but they, you know, to get the whole things at once. So they pay for each piece as they bought it. They were shooting craps on, on the fish house floor one Sunday night, and the old man got on a hot streak, and he wound up in an, in that time, hundred dollars was a lot of money and that's what he had in his pocket. So when he finished that, Monday morning the first thing he got up he went down to, my uncle ran a uh, general store and he walked in and said, Ben, that was his brother-in-law, uh, Ben Eckes, said I want to uh, buy your hardware section. So they made a deal and Pop told him, he says, I have $100. So that's what the old man bought the store with. Ben said, get it out. It's no longer mine. I don't want it here. And I started him in the hardware business. My great-grandfather was Quaker. My great-grandmother was Methodist. 
very proper Methodist lady. And when she moved here and was expecting a child, there was not a church in this area. And she told her husband, I cannot raise a child in this area if there's not a church. They had 15 acres in downtown Stewart. They donated a lot to build the first Methodist church in the area. And that Methodist church was located probably in the middle of US 1 today where the bridge touches down. And that church was purposely put on that parcel of land, I am told, because it was right next to the railroad tracks. And they wanted the people coming through on the train to see that we at least had a church in this area, that we were not a barbaric community. Mosquitoes were one of the major problems of life in early Martin County. They were very bad. Um, cattlemen told stories of flocks of mosquitoes driving herds of cattle mad. They said that when they camped out on the trail at night and they heated up their coffee, you know, mosquitoes are attracted to heat, that they would have to brush a layer or two of them off of their coffee before they could drink it. Now whether those are just tall uh, cattlemen's tales, I don't know, but they were very bad. Uh, if you lived here even up into around 1920, 24, 25, uh, how you would get dressed in the morning would be that you would get up and before you put on your shirt you would wrap newsprint or some type of heavy gauze around your arms and around your legs. Then you would put on your regular clothes. If you're going outside then you would put on a big hat with a net that hung down here you would have gloves on, and you would carry a mosquito switch which was made out of palmettas, shredded and woven to make a handle, and the way you did it, you walked along swishing back and forth like this so that the mosquitoes didn't get too heavy on the front of your net. Ernie Lyons, who was an early resident here as a boy, said that on some occasions you could see people walking along the road and it would look as if they had a cape or a veil blowing in the wind and it's the mosquitoes behind them trying to find a way through all the mosquito netting and protection. One day we had a, a, a little nephew, of course he's grown now, and here he was, he, he cut grandma had gone out and opened the bridge and he was out there with his little toes hanging right over the edge of the bridge. And my mama just yelling for me to get out there as fast as I could. And I did get out there. And he didn't move. And I had to just reach over and get him and grab him back and take him back to the house. But he got untied. My mama used to tie him to a mulberry tree back in our backyard over there at the bridge house. And uh, anyway, he got away. But he didn't get away anymore. This, the grade schools were in the woods, actually, uh, over towards East Coast Lumber Company in that area. And they had no facilities except outhouses. And I started in school, uh, I guess it was in the second grade, probably. And uh, the, uh, I had excused myself to go out to one of the outhouses, and I when I came back in, why, the teacher was up at the head of the, the class here, and we came in the back of the room, and uh, I came down, down the aisle, like, or down the, it was all wooden floors, and uh, so I, I started down the aisle there, and all the kids, all the other children there started, left the attention of the teacher altogether and started looking over at me, and uh, uh, so she just stopped talking for a little bit, and then I, worked my way in the, to my seat and, and uh, she said, uh, Curtis, she says, I guess you know you just interrupted the whole class. And uh, I didn't know what I'd done. I, I thought, gee, what did I do to interrupt the whole class? And uh, then she followed up by saying, why aren't you like the rest of the children? She says, 
those shoes you're wearing, she says they make so much noise, it's, it's, uh, it just interrupts the whole class. Everybody else was barefooted, see. And I never will forget one time they asked me to uh, be in the senior play, and I had walked out to help practice, you know, and bless my soul and body, there were two old boys, old George Thomas and Carl Barnes. And so they decided that I had, well, I think we'd finished practicing. And I started out to go home. It was dark. And so they began, they said, oh, Hazel hasn't been kissed. Let's give her a good hug and kiss. Well, boy, I ran. And I ran upstairs, crazy thing. And when I got upstairs there, the only thing, they used to have old ink wells on my desk. And so they got a little close to me. And when they did, I got that old ink bottle and I threw it and it hit the wall right back of there. And splattered all over the wall. And they said, oh my God. And they let me go. I didn't have to do another thing. When I went into this, and Mrs. Youngrod was a principal. And so I went in and I told her what happened. Boy, she called those two fellows in and she gave them, she said, I'll expel you. Boy, both of you. But she didn't. She says, no, sir, but don't you ever let this happen again. My name is Costello Williams. I was born in Key West, Florida, February the 27th, 1906, when I finished two-year college and I applied for work at different counties, but I accepted the one that I got from Martin County. And uh, I started teaching there. We didn't have a school then, but it was a very large building, and we used two rooms. Yeah. And the other teacher had first, second, third, and I had fourth, fifth, and sixth grades. The parents and like that were very nice about giving us them. The churches were nice about helping. Then after I married, it was no trouble because those people, they were rich, so anything I needed, I would tell them they would give it. Not only them, but the Bostos and the Reeds are the main ones. St. John's, you know, so. My older sisters were born in Dade County. My brother and I, which came along a little later, were born in Palm Beach County. Then my children came along and were born in Martin County, but it was all the same house. So I think that's an interesting point. When the 28 hurricane come through, it blew my grandma's store down. And Nettie said that they had just dug the uh, Roland Canal. And she said they had a big pile of dirt, which was the bank kind of it there. They had two Model A's and, and they were brand new, you know, <laughs> and they were afraid that it was going to blow them off. So they just dug a big hole in that uh, bank of that canal and stuck them cars in there and covered them over with dirt. Oh my goodness, that was the big deal. Every Saturday, if you at least had a dime during the Depression, and you, everybody would end up uh, on Saturday afternoon to see the cowboy movie, and then a, a B-rated movie, and then uh, a cartoon, and usually a serial. You know, that was a big deal. And everybody was there on Saturday afternoon. I think we spent most of our time either on the river or on the ocean. In other words, the bridge is there. You could ride across the bridge with your bicycle and we'd stay over there all day long, really. And I remember we'd take a piece of tape and put your initials on the back of each other. Then when you go out in the sun, you, before the summer's over, you were just about black. But you hear these people put tattoos, but these would look, just pull the tape off after you got sunburned. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody had to mark. <laughs> For entertainment, we either went to the beach or we went down to where Sailfish Point is now. You could get there either by walking or um, a jeep, which Daddy had. And we'd take our fishing gear and picnic things and we would catch our lunch and spend the day. So my life growing up was on the water, either in the rivers, which were clean enough to swim in, by the way, 
and uh, the ocean. I was riding my bike and an osprey, a fish hawk, came over and it had about a three pound, two pound bass in his talons and it was too much for it and he dropped it. And it dropped right in 4th Street, which is now East Ocean Boulevard, of course. And it was right about where the courthouse is now. And this fish was flopping there, it was a nice black bass, so I took my books out of my basket and put them on the sidewalk, picked up the bass and rode home, took the bass and rolled it up in some newspapers and stuck it in the refrigerator. And then when I came home at night, I cleaned the bass and we had it for supper. And it worked out great. Mine are from heaven, <laughs> out of the sky. It was my 18th birthday and it was Seymour's Inn then, it's now Funky Joe's. And it was February the 21st in 1942. And we heard a big explosion and the if anybody's been in Conky Joe's, it's the same now as it was back when Seymour had it, built on piling there, and the whole place just shook. Everybody ran outside, and by the time we got outside, we heard the second explosion, and the sky just lit up over Jensen Beach there. The first submarine had gone under, uh, sent a torpedo that went under the ship and hit the reef, and that's what made the whole coast shake. The second one hit it right amidships, and she blew up. So many people don't even know how close we came to losing that war that they sank, oh, 15 or 20 ships between Daytona and Miami. I remember we were there. Oh, we were just breaking up. We always broke up around 11 o'clock. And my land, I tell you, jarred the socks off of us. A terrible explosion. And we just knew the Germans had, had bombed Roosevelt Bridge. I'm just sure that's what happened. <laughs> and we just got in at Hobe Sound when I got a call from Mrs. Scranton over on the island. She says, V, you and Ted come just as fast as you can, bring clothing. Says, the boat was torpedoed right off the shore here. And a lifeboat with 25 men brought them to shore here at our place and they're coming into the house now. Bring clothing, bathrobes, men's clothing, and come on over and help us. So I got over there and I got on the telephone and I called everybody on Jupiter Island. It was during the season, you know, in February, and told them to bring food and clothing. Uh, it happened, you know, at 11 at night, and many of them, many of the crew, were in their bunks. And they came in just shorts. And some of them just had towels wrapped around them. So uh, we took care of them. When I came to Stewart, uh, Ernie Lyons was the editor of the paper. He opposed the channelization of the Kissimmee River. And after that project began, one morning he told me to get up about four o'clock and meet him and so we got up and we went out to the uh, North Fork of the St. Lucie River. We, we got in his rowboat, but he didn't have any fishing gear. And I didn't know what he was doing, but I'd learned that with Ernie you just went along and you didn't pester him with too many questions. And motored up the St. Lucie River and we got up about opposite where Club Med is now. Wasn't there then, of course, but Ernie threw a big cinder block with a rope around it into the water and we were anchored. And so I'm sitting there in the boat waiting to see what was going to happen. He said, just wait. The sun started to come up and when it did, uh, things kind of turned gray. The river became a kind of a slate gray and the the shores were gray and the sky was gray and everything. And I said, what are we doing? And he said, wait. And then the sun came up and it hit the river and it silvered it a little bit. And then it came up higher and it really turned it bright blue and the sky turned blue and the ground came up green with the bushes and everything. And the river exploded. Just turned into whipped cream. And it was tarpon 
coming out of the water chasing snook. I mean, big, big tarpon. When they hit the water, it's like a cannon shot, kabam, spray flying everywhere. And 25 pound snook trying to get away from these marlin whose mouths were big enough to swallow them all. And I'm sitting there like, holy smokes. And Ernie said, remember what you see. It'll never happen again. They're killing this river. And unfortunately, he was right. It was a very sort of innocent life and easy going and we made our own fun and had our little picnics and everybody felt so safe and secure. It was just a great place to grow up in. We climbed trees. We had big trees around. We climbed trees and we, we would uh, build forts and all different kind of things like that as children. Oh, it was a wonderful place to grow up. So I had a wonderful, a wonderful growing up life. It was it was uh, like a fairy tale. I think Stewart was a wonderful place to grow up in. So to grow up here, it was to me an ideal place to grow up, even though the older people wanted people to stop here instead of going on through. I think that Martin County is a great place to live. Martin County has always been a winner, and I would say if we're sitting here 100 years from now, we would say that Martin County still wins. And why? Because of the people we have here. We have super people. Tremendous number of people who are very caring and concerned about this county, and it, it makes it a county different from any other county in the state of Florida, as far as I'm concerned. We have a great many natural attractions, but the best thing that we have in this county is its people.